midnight on the stormy deep. My solitary watch I keep and think of how I left behind and as if she. That's a good idea. We will uh, we'll do an old timer that uh, we sang on the program here last night. Entitled "All the Good Times Are Past and Gone." We haven't got to rehearse this number much, but it's an old time, and a lot of folks like it. We'll do it for you.
Okay, all the good times of you here with Richard Green, who's the fiddle player for Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. Uh, where are you from, Richard? Los Angeles, California. And how did you come to Bluegrass from Los Angeles, California? Well, it, uh, it came to me uh, in the form of uh, Scott Stoneman. He's a fiddle player. Mm -hmm. uh, used to be, well, he's now again with the Stoneman family. And he happened to stay at my house for a few days or a few weeks and instilled that thing into my <laughs> blood. <laughs> I can't get it out of my blood now. Uh, did you, were you in any groups out in California? Not blue, not bluegrass groups. They were. Oh, I was in one bluegrass group just before I came east. Mm -hmm. But that was just for about a month. Uh, why did you come east? To join the Greenbrier Boys. Aha! Uh -huh. And how long were you with them? Oh, about six months. And from then on, it was uh, with Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass right. Boys. Right. I see. Uh, how did you manage to get into Bill's band here? Well, there was uh, one date. Uh, didn't happen to have a fiddle player, and uh, Ralph Rinsler knew of me and um, called me, happened to be in New York, and asked me if I'd do the show with Bill, which I did. And that and, started uh, it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Richard, uh, I, well, I heard you last uh, Wednesday night at the Gas Line on the opening night here uh, with Bill. And, uh, well, I must say that I was rather impressed by your fiddle playing. The audience seemed to like it pretty well, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons seems to be, well, apart from your tone and everything, uh, you seem to have one of the most uh, far-out inventive styles on the fiddle that I've heard recently. And I was wondering how you, uh, how you developed that style. If you can possibly put it into words. Well, I, I'll have to contradict you just a little bit okay. in order to answer that question. Um, what may seem like inventiveness is actually... Uh, a way to cover up a certain lack of knowledge I have about some of these songs. I really don't know them all as well as I should, and when I'm playing a tune that I don't know, the best way to cover it up is to, is to with, do what they call the improvising, which uh, I hope to get away from pretty, you know, as, as soon as I have time to learn all these songs. And um, fiddle playing will be more straight, uh, but in a, in a more real sense of the word, it'll also be more, more inventive than it is now. I see. And you're learning this from Bill as you go Yeah, along. from Bill directly, yeah. Well, uh, actually, probably the most uh, far out, in my terms, arrangement that, that you uh, pulled off on Wednesday night was the Orange Blossom Special version. Oh, that. Which, uh, well, Bill seems to be pretty happy with it. Uh, no, well, that's, see, that's, that's what they call a show tune. And, um, and that you can do anything on. There's no mm -hmm. restrictions or limitations or anything. In learning how to play the fiddle, did you, uh, did you listen to records or did you more or less uh, make it up out of your head as you went along? No, uh, I listened to lots of records and uh, wrote out on music paper fiddle breaks and played along with the record and tried to get everything just the way it was on the record. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. also Scott Stoneman taught me a lot about feeling, <coughs> the feeling. He didn't teach me any licks or anything. Uh -huh. I mean, he did a, f a few licks, but the main thing was feeling. Had you previously had any uh, any kind of musical experience on the violin or the fiddle? Yeah, I, I studied, uh, I took violin lessons um, when I was five <laughs> and throughout my youth. I guess that made it a little bit easier for you then when you took up bluegrass. I had, didn't have any technical problems. I, I just, think. I had, I had a much bigger problem. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to demonstrate problem? W would you like to demonstrate those problems for us now on a uh, fiddle instrumental you'd like to do, okay? Uh, you can introduce it yourself too, okay? This is uh, named after Bill Monroe, and it's called Big Mun.
Okay, that was Richard Green on the fiddle there with Big Mun. Uh, Bill, uh, I understand that you have a new album coming out pretty soon. Oh, that's right. We do have. That's on what label? That's on Decca. Right, just for the record, we have to have that. And uh, what kind of material will be featured on the record? Well, there'll be a lot of the old, older numbers that we uh, recorded a good many years back. There was some uh, records left over that uh, Jimmy Martin recorded with me, and they're going to be brought out. Numbers like My Dying Bed and numbers like that. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I don't remember the names of all of them. But uh, there'll be some uh, numbers that we do get a lot of requests for and uh, that should be brought out now. What's the name of the album? Uh, How Lonesome Sound. Fine. Uh, also, I was uh, remarking before that uh, you have, well, besides a lot of old material that you're doing on your shows, some of, uh, some of the things that you're doing are actually things that you put together maybe within the last year. And, uh, well, I'd like to hear you do one of those, uh, those new slow tunes that you do, The Walls of Time, maybe one of the new banjo instrumentals that you've uh, been coming up with recently. All right, uh, now, The Walls of Time, that's the number we're going to do uh, right away. We're going to record it, and, uh, and then we will uh, record the banjo number that Lamar's going to do, too, just in a little bit.
That was The Walls of Time you just listened to by Pete Rowan and myself, a new number that will go on deck a record before long. And now we want to call Lamar up to the microphone here to do a new number that we are going to record in a short time entitled Crossing the Cumberlands. The Cumberland. Well, we're going to call uh, James Monroe, otherwise known as Jim, over here to the microphone. He's been sitting on the sidelines watching uh, the band play because his bass is down in the Gaslight Cafe and he hasn't brought it up here. It's a fifth floor walk up, incidentally. And, uh, uh, well, Jim, uh, since uh, you are one of the uh, Monroe clan itself and you've probably just been alive a little bit more than Bluegrass itself has, uh, maybe you could have some uh, interesting light to shed on the, the matter. Uh, of bluegrass. Uh, how has it been uh, being raised along with bluegrass mu music by your father, Bill Monroe? How's it been what now? How, how has it been being raised, uh, as bluegrass music has been raised, I imagine, uh, by your father, Bill Monroe? I mean, have you been uh, right next to it as it's been developed? Oh, yeah, I've uh, listened to it all through my life, you know, and uh, I really do like it. Mm -hmm. What kind of encouragement is Bill giving you to, uh, to uh, play some bluegrass instruments and get along with actually performing it? Well, he's given me quite a bit of encouragement. He's uh, helped me quite a bit on the bass, and he's helped me now on my singing. Uh-huh. You're doing some of the uh, singing on some of the quartets, I understand. Yeah, I'm singing lead on them. How is it uh, working for your father? Uh, you're the only bluegrass boy in that situation right now. Well, I've uh, <laughs> I've had a lot of other jobs, and uh, really he's uh, better to work for than anybody I ever have. You better say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. It's been working out pretty well. How, how long have you actually been with him? Well, I guess I've been playing bass about two years now. I've just 
started, as you can tell, on my singing. Not too long. <laughs> <laughs> okay, would you like to give us an example? Uh, we heard some quartets at the Gaslight last night. I thought they worked out pretty well. So maybe you can get together right, with one we'll now. We'll do a quartet. The gang will come around the microphone here. That brings in James William, Pete Rowan, and Richard Green on the bass, and myself. <coughs> uh, boys, let's do the number that uh, Hank Williams wrote in Tidal I Saw the Light. Can you do that? Yes, sir. WKCR FM, New York. Bluegrass boys, there with I saw the light. Right now, since we are just about at the half an hour mark, if uh, if our timing here is correct, I'd like to remind you you're tuned to WKCR FM in New York City at 89.9 on the FM dial, the voice of student radio at Columbia University in New York City. And right now, we'd like to call uh, the head of the show, more or less, uh, for at least this week. Uh, Bill Monroe, over to the microphone, and I'd like to ask him a couple of questions. Uh, it seems that you have a uh, pretty good new band here with you. Uh, I haven't gotten to hear it in exactly this combination until just now, and a lot of good, fresh, young blood, and uh, you're getting to sound pretty good. What are uh, some of the things that you expect from the boys? How do you like uh, them to play so that you get the right sound out of bluegrass? Well, I expect them all to get in there and work, and, and everybody pull for each other, you know, and... and uh, uh, of course, we have to have uh, all five instruments has to get in there and really play right, you know. Um, takes a good fiddler and a good banjo player and a guitar man and a bass man and and uh, somebody to play the mallet. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a pretty good group here, I think. Uh, we, uh, some of the boys hadn't been with me very long, but the time they're here, I'd say six months, they'll, they'll really be doing it all right and be playing bluegrass music. Okay, uh, how is it that you think that uh, that the various instruments should play? I mean, each one has a, a separate part in the band, and each fil fulfills its own function. Uh, what is it that, say, the fiddle does that uh, the, instru the other instruments don't do that uh, that are most important for it to uh, fulfill? Well, uh, I've always uh, figured a fiddle to be the lead instrument, you know. And, uh, of course, he takes most of the melodies, I guess, on, and uh, uh, then 
if I'm a singing, you know, a solo or uh, we've got a duet or trio going, my he will back up the uh, the singing, you know, with a maybe some filling stuff or I might be playing some harmony along with it too, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard is not exactly one of the typical <coughs> fiddlers that you had with you. Uh, how have you been bringing him along to play in the bluegrass style? Well, Richard knows a lot about bluegrass. Of course, he could stand some more learning with it, but uh, and I'm going to do my best to to help him all I can, you know. And uh, what he is a little short of, you know, is knowing a lot of the old-time fiddle numbers, I, I think, the way they should be played, that know the melody all the way through. And, uh, of course, a lot of the songs, why well, he plays them fine. And, and I think he'll tell yourself that maybe he don't know some of the fiddle numbers. And it's, a, it's a job to know all of them, you know. And uh, give him some time. <laughs> okay, I think we will. Uh, how about Lamar on the banjo? Well, Lamar's coming along fine. He's been with us, I'd say, about uh, how long? Six or eight months or a year, something like that? It's been about that, though. And uh, he's learned to leave out a lot of stuff that I don't uh, want, you know. Uh, that's been my big problem since I've had bluegrass music, or been the head of it, to keep out the stuff that I didn't want in it, you know. That's been his bigger problem, is to get him to play, you know, what I really didn't want. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Lamar has uh, discarded a lot of it for the time being. He's got a lot of fine ideas that he brought from Washington, D.C. down to Nashville that he's going to start to add them just a little as we go along, you know, a little later. To when he gets really the, the foundation of bluegrass music and uh, really goes to driving that banjo, and he's already begun to let it ring, mm -hmm. well, he, he'll be all right. Well, what are some of the things that you mentioned before that you think should be kept out of bluegrass music? Well, real hot licks with the fiddle don't need to be in it. You don't need drums in it. You don't need a dobro in it. And... Uh, a hot guitar, you don't need that in it. Uh, what, uh, what exactly do you think is the reason for those not being in it? It just doesn't produce the right sound, or, or is it something else? Well, it gets back to, to brass, you know. Uh, uh, hot lick, if it's uh, done in a bluegrass style, that's fine. And, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to keep it that way. Bluegrass, uh, the hot music in bluegrass just goes out so far, you know. And you can, uh, can run it out too far, you know, if you just keep uh, fooling with it on a banjo or fiddle or man on either one. Mm -hmm. uh, bluegrass music has uh, stayed pretty much the same since 1945 when it was actually uh, more or less formed in, in its pretty close to present state. But uh, you certainly have brought, brought along some changes uh, since then. What do you think are some of those that you've, uh, that you've added to bluegrass? Well, bluegrass was formed in 39. Of course, we added a banjo in, for, in 43. And that gave us uh, the old-time style, the old-time sound, you know, of a banjo. Bluegrass music was formed back in 39, and all we'd done was add a, the five-string banjo. And when there wasn't hardly any around, of course, I used string beans. He'd done comedy, and I wanted a comedian in the group, mm -hmm. and, and then the touch of the, the banjo. And following string, well, of course, uh, we had Earl Scruggs, and he had the three-finger roll, and that, that gave us a, a boost with the bluegrass. But as far as it forming in 49, uh, 45, it was formed back before that. <coughs> Uh, what, what since 1945 do you think you've added to the bluegrass style? Well, I've, uh, I've brought in different ideas, you know, each year. Uh, different notes, you know, that I can remember. And, and, and with fooling with music for so long or studying it, well, you can hear things that need to be put into it and brought into it, you know, and a different way of... Uh, and maybe uh, letting the guitar do some runs, you know, that would be original now. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, with uh, the style that Richard had with the fiddle, that'll give us a boost too, you see. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have used that uh, through the years. Each man, I don't say I've done it all, but uh, through me and uh, with, with the styles they would have, you know, with the fiddle or the banjo or the guitar, would give me something on down the road, you know. I'd, I, don't, I wouldn't want to keep the same group for 25 or 30 years, you know. I would get sound an awful stale then. I see. And I want uh, new blood as I go along. Well, you certainly have it now. Uh, people have been asking me uh, personally you know, my own opinion on this subject. Uh, they, they're interested in, in knowing uh, the answer to this question. Uh, Bill, you know, as, as, as you've been going along now in country music for a long time, close to 30 years at least, uh, not only on Grand Ole Opry but all over the country, and uh, some people have asked me how long do I think uh, Bill Monroe will be continuing on in bluegrass music, and, uh, and I guess the best way to answer that question would be leaving it up to you and asking it of you. Well, uh, I, I don't really know. Uh, it seemed like time might be kind of catching up with me. I've tried to, you know, really fight the music and uh, keep it in, in the right groove and everything, you know, and really drive it hard. And 
of course, you know the time's going to come when I'll have to quit fooling with it. But I, I'd, I'd say I'll stay with it probably another 10 years. Well, I'm really glad to hear that. Uh, uh, have you have you made any plans or, or had any thoughts concerning what you will do or what you would like to do with bluegrass once you actually won't be playing it professionally with uh, with groups that tour and so on? Well, uh, I would like to keep the name of bluegrass going on, you know, and the bluegrass boys. It'll take the bluegrass boys. That that name is going to have to to play a big part in it, and I would like to uh, I'd like to see James William or somebody you know carry that name on and uh, keep it going, and I'll help out all that I can, you know. Mm -hmm. with it. Well, I'm really glad to hear that. Uh, for the more immediate future, I hear that you're going to be going to Europe pretty soon. Could you give us a little bit of information about that? Well, I, I believe that I will really enjoy the trip over there. That'll be my first trip. Um, Pete is, uh, is a smart guy of the Bluegrass Boys here, and he has uh, show dates over there and everything about it. He can really talk to you better on this than I can, I okay, guess. Okay, why don't you come over, Pete? We'll be leaving for England on uh, the 23rd of, of May and coming back on June 13th. And I ought to mention we'll be at the Starlight Room on the 19th of May. Where are you going to be in, in, uh, in England and uh, Scotland, I think they'll mention. Probably. Yeah, yeah. Different towns every night, I can't remember. Would you know exactly how this all came about? I mean, how was it that, uh, that, that you managed to get the trip going to Europe? Well, I wrote to Bill Clifton and asked him the possibility of a tour over there. And he, uh, he was, uh, wrote back a favorable reply. Bill Clifton has been uh, there himself for a while, isn't he? Yeah, right? for about five years. I see. And Roy Guest at the, uh, the Folk Society over there helped mm -hmm. us to arrange the tour. Uh, how long have you yourself been playing with Bill, Pete? Um, it's been just over a year. How do you like it? Uh, it's bluegrass music. It's bluegrass music. It is exactly bluegrass music. Nothing, exactly. nothing at all different. Uh, uh, you, of course, have been learning uh, some, uh, I've noticed myself in observing you since, uh, since the beginning days with the Bluegrass Boys. Uh, what are some of the things that you've been picking up from Bill, you think? Well, uh, how to to control my voice more, mm -hmm. and how to put the right kind of tone on it, and uh, get on top of notes. Mm -hmm. uh, how how does the actual instruction go on? Does he uh, does he tell you what you're doing wrong, or does he do it right and, and let you try to imitate it, or what? Well, uh, we stand up the microphone and sing. You see, and <laughs> practice, and uh, that's how you do it. Uh, and you kind of just get to understand what's supposed to be the right way after you, you hear it done the right way for a yeah. while. Yeah, that's right. I see. And how about your guitar playing? About uh, well, how, <laughs> well, I think it's pretty good myself. I thought it, uh, you did an awfully good job of uh, of, uh, of helping push yeah. the band and get a good sound. Well, uh, what Bill does is it, is the new ideas that we come up with. He'll help define them yeah. and uh, clean them up. And so when you hear them, it's it's, uh, it's a combination of, of his mind and ours. A finished product. Huh? Yeah. Uh, you yourself, uh, I heard that that uh, that you came to bluegrass uh, from college. Which is uh, not exactly the the normal way of uh, of going. Uh, you were you were in college just before you came uh, to uh, the Bluegrass Boys, is that right? Yeah, I fell out of it and into Bluegrass. <laughs> I see. How did that exactly happen? <clears throat> well, I, I left school to play music around Cambridge, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and I was playing with uh, Bill Keith and Jim Rooney at the time. Bill came up and needed a guitar player for a show that he was doing in Barry, Vermont, and uh, I played with him up there and then joined him in Nashville a couple of months later. I see. And you've been going since. Yeah. Well, how about uh, giving us an example of uh, Pete Rowan's fine singing abilities? We're going to have, uh, get ready to go with another song now, is that right? Uh, how much more time do we have on the program here? We have about 20 minutes or so. Uh, you know, I have an awful good friend up in this part of the country, Tex Logan. Why don't we Sorry. dedicate uh, Pete's number to him? Fine. Okay. Pete, what do you want to sing for I the I can book? do the Wheel of Garden.
with the rest of the Bluegrass Boys. If you just happen to tune in, we are doing a taping session here. This is Friday afternoon, not Sunday, as you might think it is. And uh, we are having a session here with Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. We've been talking to some of the members of the group. A little bit later, we'll be talking to Lamar Greer. But before we do that, uh, I think we'd like to hear another duet number, if you could get one up for us. All right, here's an old-time mountain number entitled Shady Grove that we uh, play and sing, so we'll do that for you. comes uh, staggering over here. He's been having a rough time here. Uh, that having, song was a little rough, yeah. Having to play all this bluegrass music with uh, with Bill Monroe. Uh, Lamar, what kind of banjo is that you're playing there? This is a Gibson Master Tones. One of the first ones I had uh, was playing banjo about a year out of Vegas, and I bought this one new. The only really thing left new is the neck. I, I swapped off parts through the years and everything else. Uh, about, about, uh, about how old there is the bottom? Uh... The back here, this wood on the back, uh, I don't know how old it is. Mm -hmm. The fellow just gave it to me and it sounded better than the one I had, so uh -huh. I kept this. It's developed. it's developed around a lot of different kinds of ideas. Uh, how did you develop your style? Well, I'd say, uh, I guess it developed from the Scruggs pattern. That's how mm -hmm. I first learned to play almost. Mm -hmm. I don't think he realized it, but he taught me how to play banjo. <laughs> did you get that from records or from? from uh, just from records, yeah. Were there any actual influences around your area that you happened to hear? Or uh... Well, Don Stover was down in Washington when I first had a banjo. 